Godfrey is Vendrick. Merica is Nashandra. Elden Ring is Dark Souls 2. Peace is often portrayed as a facade in the Souls series. A peace as deep as the dark, or a land without death, are equally dystopian. These rulers hold a stasis over their respective kingdoms in order to establish order or dominance. Power comes in many forms, and in the case of both Merica and Ashandra, it takes on the form of beauty, which is used as a tool for manipulation and gain. Their respective seats of power differ from the common notion of strength and glory, which is why these characters are so fascinating. Gone are the stereotypical kings who embody strength in battle and instead are replaced by the calculating prowess of these two queens. Welcome back to the series that is focusing on the elements common to both Dark Souls 2 and Elden Ring. It is often regarded that Elden Ring is Dark Souls 2 too, so it is only appropriate that we investigate those in leadership within Drang Lake and the lands between, Nashandra and Merica. Nashandra is a fragment of Manus, who at one point was a dark sorcerer, inheriting the title of Father of the Abyss. Being an offshoot of Manus after his death by the Chosen Undead in Dark Souls, Nashandra has an affinity for the dark. She was not only the fragment of Manus, as there were three others who inherited different qualities or aspects of his former self. In the case of Nashandra, she inherited his want. The want is believed to be the insatiable lust for power of which she had none. In other words, she represents the desire for power and whatever that might look like. She wants what she does not have. Much like her fellow fragmented sisters, Chandra sought to claim power indirectly through manipulation. She traveled to Drang Lake and assumed a form of beauty in the attempts to seduce its ruler, King Vendrick. Vendrick is the quintessential king who wields a large sword and possesses great skill in combat. Under this attractive form, she was able to seduce Vendrick and warn him of a potential threat across the sea. This threat was the giants and their potential attack on Drang Lake. In response, Vendrick would conquer the land of the giants and make Nishandra his queen. As time went on, she would lust for even greater power and sought to use Vendrick and the throne of want to obtain or control the first flame, which would dictate the world state. This was likely a plot to use the first flame to usher in an age of dark during the current cycle of an age of fire. In Elden Ring, Merica rose to power through her natural affinity towards being an Empyrean. This title or state of being made her a candidate to become a god and become vessel of the Elden Ring essentially making her the most powerful being in the lands between, aside from the greater will itself. Much like Nishandra, she was essentially queen of the lands between and sought to establish order through her will, despite the inevitable change of the world state shown through the game's multiple endings. As part of her rule, she had the rune of death removed from the Elden Ring by Malaketh in order to remove death from the lands entirely. While this might sound like a time of peace, it would be met with a war and a looming threat to the Earth Tree, the Greater Will, and the Golden Order. This threat would be an unnamed fire god worshipped by the fire giants. Similarly to the events within Drang Lake, the threat took on the form of giants that could destroy the current leadership and the order of the world. In both games, it is not clearly stated that the giants were planning an attack. There is no clear indication that either side was provoked. However, this did not matter as the giants of Drang Lake and the fire giants from the mountaintops were driven to near extinction. Both queens set out to destroy any opposition through command and manipulation through the use of their respective warrior-like partners. Merica had the help of a warrior who would come to be known as Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. This essentially made him Merica's first husband slash consort. He would also command her armies and drive the fire giants to near extinction, save for one that was left alive and imprisoned to tend the flame of ruin, which could not be extinguished. 
the flame of ruin posed a potential threat to the Yurid tree by being burned and the Golden Order collapsing as a result. Once the battle with the giants was over, Merica would banish Godfrey shortly after. He would lose his faith and purpose after his final enemy fell. Merica would also banish his kin, creating the first tarnish and losing their golden hue within their eyes and their purpose guided by grace. Godfrey would disappear from public life and influence similar to Vendrick. We in both games are frequently told how great these figures once were before meeting them towards the end of both journeys. Nishandra operates in similar ways where she uses the power of others to obtain her goals. In her case, Vendrick was manipulated in order to establish her place as Queen of Drangleic. Had he not discovered her true nature when researching the undead curse that would plague the kingdom shortly after the first war with the giants, she would have used him to gain access to the first flame. He would lock himself away as he was the key to accessing the throne of want containing the first flame. Both larger-than-life figures of Vendrick and Godfrey would be removed from rule by their queens since they did not align with their aims and goals. Nishandra also uses the player character, or the one known as the bearer of the curse, through similar means and goals. Here she seeks power from another, this time being the bearer of the curse, who at the point of meeting her was strong enough to defeat the four lords and claim access to the Ashen Mist Heart. With the Ashen Mist Heart, the bearer of the curse could gain access to the Throne of Want through the giant's kinship, which is something Nishandra did not have the skill or strength to do on her own. The giant's kinship description states that the king has the rightful throne and on that throne he chooses what he wants to see, or the throne simply shows the king what he wants. Nishandra sought to have access to shape the world to her liking, which could have been an age of darkness. While not a god like Merica, Nishandra does operate through similar means of deception and manipulation. She used her form to seduce Fendrick and become his queen, and offered guidance to the bearer of the curse to fulfill the next stage of her plans to usher in an age of dark, or one where she was in control of the world state. The goals that these queens desire are often met with the disposal of others. Power in both cases is power above others versus power of one's own abilities. Merica does seem to possess great power in the traditional sense, unlike Nishandra, but often employs the work and toil of others to see that her goals are met. As discussed earlier, Godfrey is used to quell the fire giants and their potential threat to the Ur Tree and the Golden Order. Once that threat is seemingly neutralized, he is banished by her order shortly after despite having several children with him, as well as a seemingly public persona as a ruling couple. It could be inferred that Godfrey was also banished because he could have posed a potential threat to Merica. Being admired by many, including several of the demigod children, there is a possibility his adoration by the subjects in society could have posed a potential shift away from Merica's influence and power as the embodiment of the Golden Order. The Crucible and those who have stemmed from it, including Godfrey, are seen as blasphemous. Much like Vendrick, Godfrey is depicted as an honorable warrior, loved by their subjects. Of course, these are from software games, so good and just characters do not stick around for very long. To establish greater order and control, Merica would take on a second husband, a champion known as Radagon. In contrast to Godfrey, Radagon is a leal hound of the Golden Order. He is devout to the faith and Merica more than Godfrey ever could be. Godfrey, being the typical barbarian archetype, thrives on individualism, where Radagon does not. Radagon also harbored shame for his cursed red hair, resembling that of the fire giants, which could have made him an easy mark for Merica to influence since he likely did not feel whole or truly one with the faith of the Golden Order. She would in the process remove Radagon from a current marriage and relationship with Queen Rinala. 
Much like Nishandra and the Chosen Undead, Radagon was used to further meet the desires and commands of Merica. Despite having established peace, her want would drive her further to use and discard others. She would then fuse with Radagon to essentially become the same person. It is not clearly known if this was something that Radagon wanted, but ultimately Merica was the one who commanded that they become one. This could have been an attempt to further deepen her affinity to the Golden Order by reaching a new level of divinity, similar to concepts established by alchemy depicting a divine hermaphrodite. Regardless of the reasoning, the act of fusion is all too similar to Nishandra's threats to, quote, become one with the dark. The end goal for both parties is to reach further faith with the order by conjoining. Rule is not established by individual deeds like Godfrey or Vendrick, but control over the world and its inhabitants. The desired world for both queens is a reflection of their want slash order. Be one with the dark, as stated by Nishandra, and become one with the order, or divest thyself of it, as stated by Merica. Both queens covet more and more power in very similar ways. The first flame from Dark Souls and the Elden Ring from Elden Ring both operate similarly. Both of these characters seek to have control over these physical manifestations of control of the world for similar reasons. Both desire a sense of unity or order to create the world in their image. They lied and manipulated their way to establish control and removed anyone who was deemed no longer useful. Through marriage, deception, beauty, and cunning, these queens operate as unique and formidable villains. With these concepts highlighted, feel free to let me know if I missed anything. This was a fun one as both of these characters are quite fascinating as they go against the typical leader stereotype found in fantasy games. There's so many things to find in common between these characters, such as the foreboding feeling they have over subjects like Welliger and Blacksmith Hugh. Welliger sort of has this stunned and frightened pauses when speaking about Nishandra, and Hugh literally mentions how terrifying Merica was when being instructed to forge a sword or a weapon that could kill a god. The Queen's use and disposal of other people is rather obvious, but I think getting into the end goals of both of them is very interesting, as it's almost like Merica's Order and Nishandra's Dark are one and the same to some degree. Of course this is speculation, but Merica definitely comes across as a more evolved version of Nishandra, and the same goes for Vendrick and Godfrey. These ruling couples couldn't be more similar, in fact, especially when looking at their respective wars with the giants. Perhaps the lands between was the very kingdom to rise from the next cycle after Dark Souls 2. Of course, this is coming from someone who finds the timeline order of Dark Souls 1, 3, and then 2 to make the most sense narratively. After all, many kingdoms have risen and fallen, and Drang Lake is by no means the first or the last. The same could be said for the lands between. Thanks for taking the time to check out the video, and I hope to see you in the next installment of this series. Take care.